this with me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King.
that you are loved. You are loved by an incredible God. And there's no place else in this world, in heaven and earth, where you're going to get that kind of love. There's no other proclaimed God or religion that offers complete forgiveness, making us perfect in the sight of the Father. That is an amazing gift, a gift that all we can do is give him thanks and praise. So like David said in Psalm 18, when I was surrounded, when I was sinking down, the Lord reached down with his hand and pulled me up because he delighted in me. He delights in you this morning. Wherever you are, know this, that God forgives and he loves and he never, ever, ever holds those things against us again. So let's go to prayer and know who we're praying to the Almighty, the creator of all things, the only thing greater or equal to his strength is his love for you and me. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that there's none like you. We thank you, Jesus, God, that your love for us surrounds us and keeps us. Lord God, and we just pray, God, for each one, Lord, wherever they are today, if they're closed in, God, if there's no one else around, if they're by themselves in their apartment, in their home, and they're depending on other people, God, Lord, I pray, God, they will look to you. I pray that we could be the arms and legs, oh God, and the hands, Lord Jesus, to reach out in love and compassion. Father God, let us lift our eyes and look around us. And God, and open our hearts to pray and intercede for those around us, our neighbors, our friends, our families. And God, knowing that you hear us, knowing that there's nothing else you'd rather do, God, then sweep in and show yourself strong. So we give you thanks in the powerful, glorious name, the only name under heaven, which we can be saved. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Let's continue to lift him up, for he is worthy. My desire is to know you, 
You're the fire in the morning. You're the cool in the evening. Breath in my soul. For the life in my bones. There is no hesitation in your love and affection. It's the sweetest of all. Have your way in me. 
with these online broadcasts. We just have a tendency to be spectators. I can tell you as we're recording this, God's presence is in this place tonight. So right now in your homes, would you just close your eyes? Just lift up your hands to God. Just He's right there in your midst. He's right there in your home as you worship Him. This is a little different than we've done before, but I just want you right now in your living room, wherever you're at, just close yourself in with God and just lift your hands and just praise Him for what He's done. Oh God, we worship You. Come right now, Lord. Come right now, Jesus. Come right now, oh. Open up my heart to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only you can. Jesus, have your way. in our minds to everything that you want to say. We turn our attention to your word in Jesus' name. Everyone said together. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for Church Online today. My name's Tim, and I'm so glad you decided to spend some time with us. We just hope that today's message is exactly what you need, and I'm really excited for you to hear it. But before we get to that, just a couple of quick announcements. The first thing I want to encourage you to do is to go ahead and fill out your connection card right now. You can click the link right there in the comments, and that's the best way for us to know who's here. That way we can reach out to people who are missing. It's also the best way for you to let us know what's going on in your life. Please, if we can pray for you in any way, or if you want to share a testimony, that's a great spot to put it. It's also the place where you can put how you can take your next step. So if you'd like to start serving in our in-person services or you'd like some more information on how to continue to grow in your faith, go ahead and put that on your connection card as well. And when you submit that, someone will follow up with you. If this is your first time with us, we want to just say welcome. We hope that you've enjoyed the experience, and we're excited that we're here, uh, that you're here. And so if you take a second and just fill it on the connection card as much as you feel comfortable, we'd like to just reach out to you and say thank you for spending some time with us this morning. We won't stalk you, spam you, nothing like that, but just send a note home to say thank you for worshiping with us. You can fill that out right now while I'm talking. There's just a couple of quick announcements. You may know that we're meeting again in person here in our Long Branch location. Uh, no updates yet on the Ocean Township location, but in Long Branch we're meeting at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock uh, on Sunday mornings. And so if you'd like to attend either of those services, we are requiring registration because we're capping the services at 50 people. So you can go online. Uh, we're using a free company called Eventbrite where you can save yourself a seat. Go ahead and just put how many people will be joining you. 
and uh, it'll be great to see you in person. Worship has been amazing, and you can have a little bit of community. Of course, if you can't make it or you don't feel comfortable yet, make sure you come back here every Sunday at 9 a.m. where the service will be streaming on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you prefer to watch it. And make sure you're sharing these links so that people in your little social world uh, can have some hope instead of just the usual things they see on Facebook and YouTube. So thanks so much for following us. We appreciate it. We want to let you know that in two weeks' time on Thanksgiving weekend, we're going to have a very special service as we wrap up our series, The Grudge, because we're going to actually celebrate communion both in person and we're going to encourage you to do it online as well. So we'll have more instructions on that as it comes. But if you'd like to join us uh, on Thanksgiving weekend to celebrate communion in person, make sure you go online and register ahead of time because, again, we are capping the services for safety. So that's it for our, our announcements today, and we're really excited to move on with our service. But before we do, we're going to worship God with our giving. So if you'd like to take part in that, uh, there are a couple ways you can do it. But first, let me just say thank you so much for your faithfulness. Uh, it really is amazing to see how God has been moving in everybody's lives and how through your faithfulness we continue just to be able to show up here every Sunday. We can broadcast, we can be back in person, and literally uh, I can watch the analytics. People all over the world are tuning into this message because of your faithfulness. So thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing in Long Branch, New Jersey, America, literally beyond our wildest expectations. And so if you'd like to continue to honor God with your giving, there are a couple ways you can do that. Number one, you can send your donation to our administrative offices, and that's actually uh, 1 Main Street, Suite 203, and that's in Eatontown, New Jersey, 07724, so you can do that. Or if you'd like, you can give online securely through PayPal. Go to our website, searchlightchurch.com, and there's a little tab that says Give in the top right corner. You can click on that and give securely through PayPal. Or the absolute easiest way to do it is to download the Tithely app. You can go ahead and find Searchlight Church in the drop-down menu, and you can go ahead and give now or any other time uh, during the week. Uh, and you can even set up recurring giving so that you can always honor God with your finances first. So go ahead and you can do that right now. And while you do that, let me pray for you. God, we thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness. I pray you would just meet all of our needs, God. Bless us as we celebrate you, as we worship you, as we honor you. And I pray you would just bless every gift and every giver and use this temporary thing like money to make an eternal difference in the lives of people around us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, would you give it up for Pastor Chris as he brings week three of The Grudge? Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Searchlight Church. My name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, listen, if you're joining us for church online today, I want you to know that we're so glad that you're tuning in. Uh, and for everyone else that's here in person, here at our Long Branch location, we're equally glad that you're here. And uh, we are really, really happy to be having church inside here in Long Branch. Today we're in week three of our current teaching series called The Grudge. And it's all about forgiveness. And I think it's a really fitting topic for the times that we're in, um, in, our, in our nation, in our world, and even just with our families. Maybe, maybe you have some uh, family or friends that you need to forgive. Maybe there's someone at work or maybe even someone at church that you need to forgive. Maybe you have people on your social media right now that you need to forgive. Or maybe you're the one that needs to seek forgiveness from someone else. Whatever the case is, um, holding on to a grudge can be one of the most destructive forces in your life if you don't deal with it. So through this series, our goal is to inspire, to challenge, maybe even to prod you to settle those grudges before they create damage in your life and the lives of those around you. So if you missed either week one or week two, as usual, you can go right here to our YouTube page and you can watch those sermons and catch up later in the week. But just so we're all on the same page, let me give you a few highlights from the past few Sundays. Week one, I opened up the series by talking about the little offenses which if left unchecked can become one of the devil's greatest weapons against us. And together we learn that our greatest weapon against those offenses is our reaction. That in between someone's actions and your reaction, there's a little gap. And the way that we get over getting offended is to fill the gap with love instead 
of accusations. We said that love covers a multitude of sins or offenses. Last week, Pastor Tim did a great job talking about the bigger hurts that all of us have faced. In that message, he shared a, an incredibly moving personal experience that God helped him through. And we learned that forgiving isn't the same as forgetting, and it's certainly not fair. But forgiving is simply giving others what God, through Jesus, gave each of us. And ultimately, forgiving someone else always sets you free. So we ended with a big question, not should someone be forgiven, but more importantly, how much freedom do you want? So listen, next Sunday, I'll be back here to take a little more time to talk about forgiving ourselves, which can be one of the most difficult things that we have to face. And then, this is exciting, on Thanksgiving weekend, Pastor Tim's going to wrap up the series by drawing the connection between being thankful and being forgiven. And you really don't want to miss church that day, whether you're here live or online, because we're going to celebrate communion in all of those worship environments. So it's going to be a great wrap-up to the series. So today I want to talk about a topic that uh, I think all of us probably can understand. It's the idea of forgiving God. Let me ask you this. How many of you love an awesome testimony of God's faithfulness? I know I love to hear when God does something big. Maybe someone shared how they were challenged to start tithing, and when they became obedient to God's word, they got an amazing promotion or a huge raise. Maybe it was a single guy or girl that was holding out for a godly mate. You know, I mean, they took it so seriously, they prayed about it, they fasted, they refused to compromise, and God blessed them with the perfect person. You know the guy, uh, he's already memorized three quarters of the New Testament and happens to look like Brad Pitt's brother, right? That's how crazy it was that God answered their prayer. Maybe it was a desperate cry of a parent whose adult child was lost on drugs or other self-destructive behavior. And after years of praying, that person walked through the doors of the church and surrendered his or her life to Jesus. When we come to a worship and a prayer night here at Searchlight, we love to hear those stories. But what if that's not how your story ends? Maybe you took the tithing challenge and the next week you got laid off or your car broke down, or you got an unexpected medical expense, you might feel like you need to forgive God because he didn't come through for you. Maybe you broke it off with someone who wanted nothing to do with Jesus so that you could honor God with your life to the next level, and unfortunately, that was your last date since February 2017. I don't know. Or maybe you've been praying for, the, uh, for your child year after year, and they seem to be going further and further in the wrong direction, or worse yet, maybe you have even lost that adult child. Sounds like you may need to ask God, uh, or you may need to forgive God. The truth is, when things don't go the way we want them to go, we tend to have a feeling towards God, and honestly, it's completely normal. We, we have this feeling uh, that, after all, if he is in control of everything, why couldn't he just make it all work out the way I want it to work? And when that happens, we find ourselves in a position where God seems to be in need of our forgiveness. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But before I go any further, let's stop and pray because honestly, guys, this is a really tough topic to talk about and we need God's grace as we try to work through it. Right where you're at, would you just bow your head, close your eyes and let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to everything you want to say and help us as we uh, attempt to understand what your word has to say about forgiving you and dealing with life when it doesn't work out the way we hope it, it should. And so be with us for the rest of this service, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you're planning on following along with the note card, go ahead and grab it and let's jump in together. If you're in church today live, uh, you should have received that card in your packet. And if you're watching today online, you can download the link that's provided right there uh, in uh, the comments. But the, the first thing that we need to understand this morning, if you're taking notes, is this. Forgiving God is more about us than him. In some ways, it's very similar to what Pastor Tim said last week when he said that forgiving others actually sets us free. When we hold on to resentment towards God, I believe it makes God sad, uh, and his heart is always uh, for there to be a connection between himself and his creation. But the reality is that we aren't hurting God by holding things against him. The real damage is always done to ourselves when we refuse 
to forgive God. Maybe in your story, your grudge against God had to do with the baby that you prayed for and you never were able to conceive, or the healing for a loved one that you prayed for that never happened. And when those things happen, we can easily develop what we would call a grudge towards God because he didn't deal with things the way we thought he should. It's like we need to forgive him for letting us down. But if you think about it, God doesn't sin. So he really doesn't need to be forgiven for anything. What we really need to do is reconcile with him. That's your next fill-in. We need to reconcile with God. Most of us probably know what it means to reconcile something, right? When you, and I, and I know I'm going to date myself by this illustration, but when you reconcile your checkbook, some of you are watching this, you don't know what a checkbook is, right? But when you reconcile your checkbook, right, uh, you make sure that all the checks were written are there and all the money that you deposited and at the end of the month or each week, you make sure that the balances equal out, right? You make sure that it's all in alignment. When you reconcile a friendship that you work to put the past behind you and make it right, like the way it was before there was a problem. Rather than forgiving God, what we really need to do is, is come to terms with the outcome of our situation and decide that we can move forward in our relationship with him. So from this point forward in the message, when I say that we need to forgive God, that's what I'm talking about, and I think that'll make more sense as I go on a little bit further. The sad truth is when we refuse to forgive God, a lot of horrible things begin to develop in our hearts and in our lives. Maybe you know someone who's gone through something really tough, and they blame God, and they're really bitter and angry because of it. You might hear them say things like, God, you took my husband or you took my wife away from me. God, how could you let me lose my job like this? Now I'm desolate and hopeless. Honestly, I remember telling God how angry I was uh, during the first year of her life. She, Zoe was born sick. Um, in fact, probably in her first year here on earth, we spent all, close to four months in the hospital, five surgeries in the first nine months. And I can remember being angry with God. I can remember telling God how angry and upset I was, that I was bitter and angry, that I was here serving him the best I could, and she was so sick. The truth is, it doesn't just end with bitterness and anger. When we continue to hold a grudge against God, it turns into resentment, and ultimately it turns into separation from God. Sometimes when that grudge against God gets so bad and goes on for so long, you can't even be around that person anymore because they're so miserable, and it doesn't stop there. When you hold a, gr a grudge against God, that grudge, uh, um, it, it becomes a, a grudge against anyone else whose situation doesn't seem to be as bad as your situation is. You know, the only solution to this problem is to forgive God or to reconcile your relationship with him so you can learn to trust him again with your life. So let me ask you this. What is it that causes this broken relationship, this broken trust between us and God? If we really believe that God is not a human being with a sinful nature and, and, and that because God doesn't sin, there really is, isn't anything that we need to forgive him for. What really is the issue that I think causes millions of people to hold a grudge against God? It's your next fill-in. It's God's sovereignty is always the issue. God's sovereignty is the issue. Let me share a definition of the sovereignty of God. One commentator put it this way. Sovereignty of God is the Christian teaching that God is the supreme authority and all things are under his control. God is the sovereign Lord of all by an incontestable right as the creator, owner, and possessor of heaven and earth. Sovereignty is an attribute of God based upon the premise that God as the creator of heaven and earth has absolute right and full authority to do or allow whatever he desires. Truth is, I think many people have some really wrong beliefs about the character and the nature of God, especially when it comes to things that he does and things that he allows in life. Let me give you a couple of examples. Maybe, maybe this has been you or you know somebody that sees God kind of like a genie in a lamp, right? You ever know someone like that? Just rub me the right way and the genie appears. Your wish is my command. You get three wishes, right? Some people view God as like a cosmic vending machine. You ever meet somebody like that? That if they push the right buttons, then God will somehow drop their answers out, right? If I, if I go to church enough times, then God will take care of me. If I put some money in the plate, then God will work it out in my direction. I mean, even people who don't go to church 
who kind of loosely believe that there's a God out there somewhere, believe this way, right? If I'm a good enough person, God will take care of me. Somehow, if I do enough good to offset the bad that I do, God will kind of make my life work out okay. How many of you have heard somebody say this before? He's a good person. He doesn't deserve to get a sickness like that, right? Or she's just too good of a person to have that kind of tragedy happen to her. So many people have this view of God, but the problem is in that view, there's no room for the sovereignty of God in the equation. If I do all the right things and still God allows something bad to happen, well, it's unfair and I'm angry and now I have a grudge against God. God, I'm trusting you and I'm giving all that I can give. I'm serving. How could you let this happen to me? And the grudge grows even uglier when we look, and you know you do it, when we look to the right or the left and we see people that we know we're better than, but it seems like God is blessing them and yet I'm going through this hardship. See, God is sovereign. And when his decisions don't line up with our desires, we can easily develop a grudge against him. So real quick, let me give you three examples of God's sovereignty. And I'm going to walk through some Bible verses and some accounts to help us understand what I'm talking about. Number one, the first kind of example of God's sovereignty is his ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55 puts it this way. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth... So my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. One of the biggest reasons we tend to develop a grudge against God is when his ways don't line up with our ways. When things just don't add up, according to my human earthly perspective, that's when I get angry and bitter and develop a grudge. God, there is no way that this makes sense to me. Look at the devastation and the destruction that these kids have to live with because you took their father or mother too early like you did. It doesn't make sense. And the end result is a broken relationship with God that can only be fixed if we reconcile with him and acknowledge that his ways are higher than our ways because he's sovereign. Here's a second example of God's sovereignty. His timing is not our timing. In the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, we read the account of a woman named Hannah. Now, Hannah was married to a guy named Elkanah. Actually, Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and the other one was named Penina. The name Elkanah actually means God has created a son. It could also be interpreted as God will give you a son. And we learn from this story that Hannah wasn't able to conceive a child and it caused her great distress. Imagine she's married to a guy whose name basically means God will give you a son, and it's impossible for her to do that. Because of this, Elkanah took Penina as a second wife, and she gave him some children. And as, as, we, as we read this account, we can see that Penina wasn't a very nice person, and she loved to kind of throw it in Hannah's face that she was barren. In fact, each year, Elkanah would take his whole family, both wives and the kids, to a place called Shiloh for a time of worship and sacrifice. And Penina made that trip horrible every year. If you have your smartphone or your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6. And let's pick up and read the story a little bit so we can gain some understanding. It says, So Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Look at verse 7. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle, Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. So here's Hannah. She loves God. She's doing everything she's supposed to be doing to be a good wife and a servant of God. And year after year, year, not only is her prayer not answered, but she has to endure the horrible treatment from Penina. And honestly, Penina was probably so mean because the name Penina is kind of a horrible name. If I was named Penina, I probably would be mean too, right? Can you imagine Hannah's feelings as she cried out to God? God, why won't you bless me with children? Worse yet, why are you blessing her with children? I'm faithful, I'm good, I love you, God, but no children. Year after year, she prayed, she believed, and she waited. 
I don't know, does that sound like something that's gone on in your life? When your timing doesn't line up with God's timing, year after year, you prayed for that loved one to come to salvation and it's not happening. Year after year, you beg God for healing in your own life or someone that you love and it's not happening. Maybe for you, year after year, you've asked God to heal you of depression or anxiety and it still continues to plague you. It goes on to tell us that after one of the sacrificial meals, Hannah went to pray and she was in deep anguish, crying bitterly, as she prayed to the Lord. And in her prayer, she promised God, God, if you would just grant me a son, I promise I will surrender him to you for all the days of his life. It goes on to tell us that the priest actually saw her praying in such distress, and they had a conversation where eventually he goes on to tell her that her request before the Lord has been heard, and it's going to be granted. But she still had to wait. And then in verse 19, it says this, the entire family got up early the next morning and went, went to worship the Lord once more. Here's what we need to notice about this story is that in the midst of all of this anguish, she never stopped worshiping God. And if you're praying right now, if you're believing, if you're waiting, let me give you two things to hold on to that we can learn from Hannah's life. Number one is this, a waiting season isn't a wasted season. Check out what it goes on to say in verses 19 to 20. It says, Then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. If you're in a season of waiting, I want you to remember this as well. God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. Just because Hannah's answers were delayed didn't mean they were denied, but I wonder if we would even be reading this story if Hannah had allowed her situation to create a grudge against God. See, God's sovereign, and his ways are not our ways, and his timing is not our timing. But lastly, if you're still taking notes, his answers are not always our answers. How often do we develop a grudge against God because the answers that we seem to be getting don't line up with the answers that we're expecting, the things that we want to hear from God. Look what God says in Isaiah 45, starting in verse 7. It says this, I create the light and I make the darkness. I send good times and bad times. I, the Lord, am the one who does these things. Open up, O heavens, and pour out your righteousness. Let the earth uh, open wide so salvation and righteousness can sprout up together. I, the Lord, created them. What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? And listen to this, it's crazy. Does the clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot exclaim, how clumsy can you be? Here's the truth. What causes a grudge against God? Is it that God is human, that he sins, and we need to forgive him? No. The issue always has to do with his sovereignty. When his ways don't line up with our ways. When his timing doesn't line up with our timing. And when his answers don't line up with our answers. That's when, if we're not careful, we can develop a grudge that needs to be reconciled. You know, as I was writing this message and preparing, I thought to myself, you know, at least Hannah's story got a happy ending at the end of her struggle. Yeah, she was tormented by Penina and, and, you know, life was tough and she had to wait and she cried out and she was upset, right? But Hannah got the last word and her child went on to be great in the kingdom of God. But what about those of us who believe, we pray, we wait, and we never get the happy ending that we were hoping for? How can we not develop a grudge against God? Truth is, I could wrap this message up right here with a happy ending to Hannah's story, but there's still more to cover this morning. Maybe you've been listening today, and secretly, you're sitting in your seat, and you're thinking the same thing. Yeah, I trusted God, I waited, I prayed, I did all I could do, and we still lost our house. Yeah, I trusted God, I waited, and I prayed, I did all I could do, and I still lost my loved one. I trusted God. I waited. I prayed. I believed. I did all I could do. And my marriage still crumbled and ended. So I'd like to bring this message to a conclusion by attempting to answer 
The last question to the best of my ability, according to God's word, and it's this, if you're still taking notes, how do I forgive God when there's no happy ending to my story? For starters, I want you to turn to your Bible, uh, turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. There's a portion of scripture that celebrates and commemorates so many throughout scripture that had enormous faith and were used mightily by God. It mentions Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Rahab. And then look what it says in verse 32 to 40. It's, it's crazy. It says this. Read it with me. It says, It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Check out verse 35. Women received their loved ones back again from the death. Lots of happy endings in those accounts, right? Those are the stories that we love to hear when we go to church. We love those on testimony nights. God doing all these amazing things and raising things back to life. But listen what it goes on to say. Others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at. And their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. That's not a happy ending at all. When I read those verses, man, I don't like Hebrews 11, right? I mean, I want to hear about the victory. I want to hear about all the amazing things that God did and how he's going to use us and God has a great plan for you to prosper you and help you to conquer everything and blah, 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 right? I want to hear all those things. I don't want to hear about stoning. I don't want to hear about being sawed in two. I don't want to hear about dying and not receiving all of the promises that God gave me. How could they be credited right alongside those who experienced enormous victories on this side of eternity. First, let me say this, guys. Forgiving God or reconciling with God when we've experienced the darkest and most painful disappointments in life is not easy, and it doesn't happen overnight. Every one of us who has believed, prayed, and waited only to not receive a happy ending knows the pain and the anguish that comes along with that journey. We also know how it feels to have some well-intentioned person tell us to just believe or that they're in a better place. Or worse yet, God's got a plan and everything happens for a reason. Do you ever get somebody that just throws out one of those answers when you're in a dark place? But still there needs to be some way that we can come to a place of reconciling our relationship with God even after suffering horrible loss. There must be some way to work our way back to that place where we can trust God again with our lives to take care of us and hold us in his hands. And as I close the message, I'd like to offer three things that maybe can help you if that's where you're at today. If you say, hey, the story of Hannah, that's awesome, but it all worked out for her in the end, but what about me? There are by no means simple, surefire solutions to this, but I believe If you'll do your best to apply these truths with with God's grace and by his Holy Spirit, I think you can begin to forgive God and trust him again. Here's your first step. It's to surrender your expectations. You know, God never promised us in this life that it would be easy or that we would never suffer. In fact, the exact opposite is true, and Jesus made it quite clear in John 16. Jesus was preparing to give his life on the cross for the sins of all mankind. He spent three years literally showing the world exactly what an invisible God looks like through his teaching, through his miracles, and through his love for people. And now he was like preparing his disciples for the future, and he said these words to them in verse 33. Many of you have heard them before. He said, I have told you this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcome come the world. 
You know, when you're faced with a horrible ending to something that you've prayed about, that you've believed for and waited for, forgiving God um, for letting those things happen starts with surrendering your expectations based on what Jesus actually said and lived out in his own life. Nowhere in scripture does God say, I'll handle everything the way you want me to handle it so that you don't suffer. Nowhere in scripture does God say, just follow me and believe and your years on earth will be all roses. What Jesus did say is that in this life, you will have trials, but take heart because I've overcome the world. In this temporary life, you can expect trials and difficulties. In this short, non-eternal life, there will be trials. In your time here on earth, which feels like everything, but in reality is only a blib on the radar screen of eternity, you will go through things that are horrible at times. But I have eternity all sewn up. I've taken care of it, and I won't let you down. That's the first step, surrendering our expectations. It means that I'm not going to hold God to my expectations of what this life is going to give me. Instead, I'm going to hold my expectations to the life of God and trust that whatever he allows in my life, he will use for his glory in the bigger eternal picture. Here's the second step to forgiving God when we don't get the ending that we want. We have to keep our hands on God's work in this life. Paul wrote this to the church in Galatia. He said this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing. What if we don't give up? This might seem like a trivial suggestion, but I believe it's huge when it comes to working through our disappointments with God when we suffer in this life. As hard as it may be, do everything you can to keep your hands busy with the work for God while you work through your hurt and your disappointment. Paul said, don't get tired of doing good. Don't give up. Listen, the enemy's going to come to you. If that's the place that you're at, he's going to come to you, and he's going to whisper in your ear, why bother going to that church and serving after God let you down the way he did? He'll say things like, after all the years you gave to God, to that church, this is how he chooses to repay you? He'll say things like, if God really loved you, he would have spared your loved one. Just leave it all behind. And when we feel that way, which honestly, guys, is completely natural, we need to answer with scripture. Jesus showed us when he was tempted that the answer to those things that the enemy throws at us is scripture. In this world, we're going to have trouble, but take heart. He has overcome the world. So listen, first, we need to surrender our expectations. Secondly, we need to keep our hands on God's work in this life. And last, We need to keep our eyes on God's provision for the next life. Paul wrote wrote Philippians while sitting in prison for preaching the gospel, and he he had some powerful words to say when it comes to suffering in this lifetime. We know that he suffered greatly during his time on earth, and yet he never held a grudge against God for the trials he endured. In fact, he counted it as an honor to suffer with Christ. Check out what he said in Philippians 1, starting in verse 20. He said, For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. You know, I don't hear Paul saying, as long as everything works out okay and I get through this life and it's not too difficult, I'll honor God. No, he says, dead or alive. I will honor God in either situation. Then he goes on to say this. For me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ, so I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go be with Christ, which would be better for me, but for your sakes, it's better that I continue to live. Here Paul shows us by his example what it looks like to keep your hands on God's work here in this life, but keep your eyes on God's provision for the next. You know, I think one of the reasons we build up a grudge against God when we don't get the the ending that we want is that we get this principle backwards. Maybe this has been the case in your life. I know in my life I've fallen into this, right? Instead of keeping our hands on the work that God has in this life and keeping our eyes on God's provision in the next life, We start keeping our eyes on the desires and the brokenness that we feel in this life 
while at the same time we're trying to get our hands on all the blessing and the promises that God gives us for the next life. What does God promise us in the next life? No pain, no suffering, no weeping, reunion with those that we love that have gone on before us. Man, the reality is we get a, into a situation where we have a grudge against God when we, we, we have our eyes focused on what we're going through here, but we want all that God promises, not here, but in the next life. I want no pain. I want no suffering. I want everything to work out. And that is a picture of heaven and eternity. It's not a picture of here on earth. Yes, he'll give us everything we need in this life and even some of what we want in this life. But this world will always be broken and there will always be pain on this side of eternity. Look what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. And honestly, it was probably the last letter that he wrote before giving his life for Christ. He said this, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've remained faithful. And now, now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And that prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. And then look what he says in verse 18. Skip down. He says, yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Notice he didn't say that God would deliver him from every hardship, from every difficulty, from every disappointment or loss. You know, as I was preparing this message, I realized that this was probably 25 years or so after Paul personally witnessed Stephen, the first martyr for Christ, stoned to death in the streets. It says in Acts that Stephen looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father and they were so infuriated with him after he preached this powerful message that they picked up rocks. You know, when you think of stoning, it's, it's not like pebbles, man. They picked up boulders, big rocks. In fact, when they planned on stoning someone, everybody collected all the biggest, sharpest, heaviest rocks they could possibly pick up and throw and they killed him right in front of Paul. Stephen had his hands on the work of God in this life while keeping his eyes focused, actually physically focused up on God's provision for the next life. I wonder how many times in Paul's ministry that maybe he remembered that day. It's impossible to know that. I wonder if there were times when he was in jail or there are times as he was watching God's hand move in his life that he reflected back that as back then when he was known as Saul, it says that he agreed with everything that happened with Stephen. I wonder if he reflected back that as he watched Stephen pass from this life that's temporary into God's provision for the next life, if he wondered if, that, if what he watched had an impact on him before he changed from Saul to Paul. I wonder if he thought about that. The truth is, guys, God is sovereign his ways are not our ways. His timing is not our timing. His answers may not be our answers, but he wants us to keep our hands on his work in this life while we keep our eyes on his provision in the next life. Here's the reality, guys, and this is, I think, a really powerful thought. If God removed every pain and sorrow from this life, if God kept us from ever suffering a loss or feeling the pain of this world, if God answered every prayer immediately and exactly the way we wanted while we lived in this life, why would we ever long to go to the next life? I mean, quite honestly, if we're, we're painting a picture of perfection and paradise, if we never suffered or dealt with any pain and God answered everything exactly the way I wanted it to be, there would be nothing in me that would long for a better life in eternity. You know, it's a proven principle that until the pain of my current state becomes worse than the pain of changing, I'll never change and I'll always stay the same. Perhaps God, in his infinite wisdom and eternal perspective, allows us to go through some pain and suffering in this life so that we long to spend eternity in a place where there is no pain and there is no suffering. So as I wrap it up this morning, let me leave you with this. It's your last set of fill-ins, and I'm going to cover them really quickly. God is always working in me, even when 
Number one, it doesn't make sense to me. God's always working in you, even when it doesn't make sense to you. When you look at your suffering and things that aren't working out the way you want them to work out, remember this, guys, that God is not abandoning you, and he is always working in you, even when it doesn't make sense. Secondly, he's always working in you, even when his timing doesn't match yours or mine. He's always working in me when his timing doesn't match mine. When you're praying and you're waiting and you're believing, and it seems for some year after year after year, he's not answering, he's not, doesn't seem to be bringing you to that happy ending that you see so many times in other people when you look around. It doesn't mean that he's abandoned you. It doesn't mean that you're off the mark. He's working something in you even when his timing doesn't match yours. Here's the third one. God's always working in me even when he doesn't answer the way I would answer. You know, there's times when we just can't understand why God would not answer the prayer the way we want it answered in our lives. But the truth is, guys, God's sovereign. It's impossible for us to know everything that's going on around us and in the world and how our suffering affects others. You know, think about Stephen and how he was stoned in the street. I think about all the things that God did after that happened, the persecution that was launched against the church, which pushed the church out of its comfort zone from Jerusalem, then to Judea, to Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You know, I don't think it would have happened that way if Stephen wasn't stoned. I don't think that Saul would have become Paul if he didn't stand there and watch as Stephen died. You know, what would have happened if Stephen refused to give his life? Say, well, if God really loved me, he wouldn't allow me to be here to suffer this kind of death. You know, I think we don't know what the history of the church would have wrapped up to be, but I know that God in his infinite wisdom, as he looked down on Stephen, as he surrendered his life, it's like God was saying to him, don't worry about this temporary trial. Come on up here with us. I have everything taken care of for the rest of eternity. Listen, as we close in prayer, if you're holding a grudge, I know these are hard words to hear, and maybe you're listening and you're not ready to hear it, or maybe you're angered at what I'm saying or frustrated. Uh, Maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, who is this guy who thinks he can tell me how to handle my suffering and how to trust God. Guys, I don't have the time today to talk about some of the losses that my family has had in our own lives. Serious losses, loss of, loss of family members way, way, way too young for anyone to lose a parent or a loved one. People taken tragically from us when we were not expecting it. Guys, the truth is Jesus never said we wouldn't have trouble. He said, take heart because he's over come the world. If you're listening to this, you're watching this today, and you're holding a grudge against God, can I challenge you to let him work in you as you put your hands on his work in this life and you focus your eyes on his provision for the next life. He's got this covered. Right now, would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and let me pray for you today. Just with with every head bowed and every eye closed wherever you're at, These are hard teachings. This is tough to acknowledge God's sovereignty. It's tough to acknowledge that sometimes God will answer the way we hope he answers, but sometimes he won't. And part of trusting God is trusting that his plans for us are greater than we could ever think or imagine. And even through the hardships and even in the difficulties, he's working in us when we don't understand, when it doesn't make sense when the timing isn't what we think it should be, and when the answers don't line up, he's still working in us to draw us closer to himself. If you're listening and you're struggling with this right now, I want to pray for you. And so right there where you're at, just lift up your hand, just as an act of faith. I can't see you, but as an act of faith, raise your hand. Say, God, I need help reconciling with you. I need help forgiving you. Not that you've sinned or you've done anything wrong. I just need help to get my relationship back where it needs to be, where I can trust you with my life again. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray for my friends that are listening or watching this. Maybe somebody will be watching this years later after we've recorded it, and, this, and they were uh, destined to hear this message 
because of what they're going through. It's impossible to know that. But God, your word is true and it endures forever. It says that your word will not return void when it's put out there, when it's preached, when it's shared. And so whoever needs to hear this, God, I pray that they hear it, that you love us, that you care for us, and that our expectations are that while we'll go through difficulties and pain, and many times maybe where we don't get the ending that we want, we should take heart because you have overcome the world. And so Lord, help us to put our hands on the work at hand, to correct and align our expectations with your word, to put our hands on your work that we have to do in this life and focus our attention on the promises that you have for us in the next life. And God, help us to put this into practice as we work our best to serve you and love you and forgive you if need be and to walk this life out the way you want us to walk it out. We pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said together, amen. Amen. Guys, God bless you. I hope that you can apply these things in your life and take those steps to forgive God. Hey, don't forget to like, comment, and share this video with people that you think might need it. And guys, we'll see you next week for part four of The Grudge. Have a great week. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for Church Online today. We hope you enjoyed your time with us. And if you did, make sure you like this video, leave us a comment so we know who's here, and share this video on your own wall so other people can have a little bit of hope this week. Don't forget to fill out your connection cards so we know who's here. And if we can join you in prayer on anything, that would be our privilege. We look forward to seeing you next week. And the week after that, don't forget, we'll be celebrating communion the week of Thanksgiving. So plan to join us. Don't forget to register online for our future services. And we hope you have a great week. God bless you.